Uh, the f earlier on, I was a wee bit worried where I was introduced and said, uh, why, how can God ruin our life? Now, this is the speaker that we're going to have tonight. <laughs> But, but it is a very important theme, isn't it? Why would God do something like that? Yeah, we've sung about God being the God of the impossible, and he is. And if we had folk uh, share your testimony, I'm sure there are many examples here tonight of impossible situations to us that God has worked in. But there are things that come our way that... Sometimes they're completely unexpected. And as we heard in that song before, sometimes we ask that question, Lord, where are you? And some of the reasons are like the one that was portrayed there, that we suddenly hear the news that someone in the family, or maybe even ourselves, has an illness, and the doctor says in human terms, there's really no hope. And we can think at times like that, where are you, God? And sometimes it's with our job that we're happy there and the boss says, come into my office. I've something to tell you. The firm's going through a difficult time right now and we're so we're going to have to put you off. And we can ask ourselves, where are you, God? And sometimes there are things on even a, a bigger scale. Uh, Lois and I were down in... Uh, Darfield near Christchurch, which is the epicenter of that first earthquake, 7.1. Same as hit Haiti, and I think I'm right when I say over in Haiti there are about 300,000 uh, people who were killed. In Darfield that time there were none. And so he said, Lord, thank you, that's a real miracle. A strong earthquake like that and not one person is, is killed. And then a few months later, we had the second one in Christchurch. And you know the story, about 200 people were killed. I was also police chaplain at that time. And so one of the things that I did, right after the earthquake, they gathered all of the people that thought they had lost someone. And it was in a school auditorium where it seated about 800 people. And they're all waiting there for news that they pretty much knew would be bad. So I was sitting there, usually when you go to a funeral or something, they're what we call prime grievers, those who are the family, and then others come to support them. In this case, everyone was a prime griever. And when someone was sitting next to us, I, didn't, you know, I had to think carefully what to say. You can't say, how was your day? Because you knew their day wasn't very good. And the Prime Minister was there at one of these and he said, I was talking to a man who was here today. The other day he was going off to work. His family was there, his wife and his business. By the end of the day, his wife had been killed in the earthquake. His business had been wiped out and his home wiped out. And you can imagine people at times like that saying, where is God in this? And it's a difficult thing. You know what happened down there when there are people who are suffering, the people who call themselves Christians turned up from somewhere and they asked people, is your house destroyed? And they said, yes. And what these people said was, we just want to let you know that this is God's punishment for you. Now, there are, there are times we need to li listen to God, but by far the vast number of Christians there, <clears throat> and it's the untold story, where there is a supporting people, and the recovery of Christchurch wouldn't have happened without the people of God. But it's those difficult times. You know, there are times that when God does discipline us. We don't like to talk about God punishing us, about him disciplining us. But when I was a kid, it was often a bit hard to work out the difference between discipline and punishment. And sometimes 
anyone outside the family of God who is working against the principles of God can count on things getting difficult and hard at times. And also for people who are in God's family but not walking with him, there are times he's going to get our attention. And you say, why is God ruining my life? He does it because he, he loves us. And there's a passage that speaks of the way that he disciplines us in Hebrews chapter 12 where it says, Have you forgotten that word of encouragement uh, that addresses you as sons? My sons, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord's discipline, those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as sons, and we could put in their daughters too, endures hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons and daughters, for what son is not disciplined by his father? So there are times that God does discipline us, and when we're walking outside of his guidance and his direction, we can count on him on getting our attention. And sometimes it is through sickness and sometimes it is with losing our job or something like that. But he still loves us and he cares, cares for us. You know, in the Old Testament, you can read uh, in the book of Judges, for example, of the people of God when they walk with him there was peace and there was prosperity and then it uh, tells about times when they worshipped other gods, they forgot about God, they worked against him and that covering of protection was lifted from them and then they came back to God and had that blessing and it can happen to us as individuals. So does God discipline us? Yes, he does. And he does it not because he hates us but because he loves us and cares for us just as uh, those of us who are parents here discipline our children, it's not to harm them, but to help them. So there are times when God does uh, discipline us. The, you know, it's good to look at the promises in God's Word. There are thousands and thousands of promises there. We used to have a little promise box. I don't know if maybe it's just the old folks had it. Little promises that were rolled up and you pulled up one and there was your encouragement for the day. There's one promise that I don't think was in that box and it was this from John 16:33. In this world you will have trouble. It's not all the verse that says, but I have overcome the world. So even though we are people who follow the Lord, we're not disobeying him, we're seeking to walk with him we're not immune to trouble as well. And the challenge is to have faith in God when the sun isn't shining and when it's difficult and it's hard, as well as when everything's going well. So let me tell you about that. He also says that he does it so that our faith will be strengthened. Look at 1 Peter 1, verses 6 and 7. In this you greatly rejoice, so... Now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of uh, things. Yeah. Verse 7. These have come so your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So that, sometimes that's why he lets us go through these difficult times. And we might say, why is God letting this happen to me? And why is he ruining my life? But he permits things to happen to us so that our faith can be strengthened. Even when it's dark and when it's difficult. One of the uh, passages of scripture that uh, Lois and I have uh, shared around the country, or mainly me, but Lois has heard it so many times that she could share it too. It's from Psalm 134. It says, Praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who minister by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. May the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, 
bless you from Zion. One of the shortest psalms that speaks of those who worship God in the sanctuary. That's when the people of God at that time gathered in the temple. It would be on the Sabbath, and it was obvious that God was there, that he was working. There was praise, there were people were there. But it also talks about the priest who ministered at night. Now this was right through the night. It wasn't just in an evening like this. And there was a small group of uh, priests who worked in this lonely, dark place. And nobody expected anything of consequence to happen. And maybe when they were there, they would say, why has God ruined our lives that brought us to this difficult place where it's dark and lonely and not to a place where there's obvious blessing? We saw this in a little a devotional. It was called A Voice in the Night. So let me tell you about yeah, just three people who's had an absolute trust and confidence in God and who are ready to be voices in the night in places that were difficult and hard and where it looked like God wasn't uh, working at all. You know, it's great when God leads us to places of blessing like we have here. But some of us are in dark places, sometimes in our home, in our place of work. And we say, where are you, God? Why have you sent me here? Here are my uh, parents, David and Isabel Patrick. They were just engaged at that stage. This was in 1940 on the Dunedin Railway Station, ready to go as missionaries to Bolivia and South America. It wasn't just getting on a plane. It was many weeks uh, going by train and boat. They got there, did language uh, training. They were just engaged at that stage, so they got posted different places, got married, and then found the place that God had called them, one of the most loneliest places that you could find on the planet. Bolivia's an isolated country, <clears throat> and they found that the place that God was telling them to go was to a village that was three days' journey from the nearest road, not from the nearest airport, from the nearest road. And they got there by horse and donkey, lived in a mud hut. While they were there, they were expecting... Uh, the birth of twins, they went to the city of Aurora, which is a barren mining town 12,000 feet high in the Andes. And there these little girls were born, but because of the thinness of the atmosphere, lack of oxygen, and the lack of medical help, they died after 10 days. So here were these people, commi uh, completely committed to the Saviour and working for him, and this country there, and this happened. I don't think I ever heard my parents ever question God at all. But that wasn't the end of the story. They found themselves in another village. There'd been some missionaries there beforehand, but for all intents and purposes, it was working from ground zero, just a small handful of believers. And my parents worked there for a number of years and saw three or four people come to the Lord came back to New Zealand ready to go back to Bolivia. My dad at the age of 47 got a complication of the mumps and passed away. And so mum was left to look after us kids. Soon after that she got uh, cancer, was given five years to live. A person of faith prayed that she'd live long enough to see us kids growing up and typical to the answer to her prayers, 40 years later she passed away. But my mum and my dad could have said, why did God ruin our lives like that? Why send us to a place? There weren't even any guaranteed wages or anything like that. Mum told of having, she only told it once or twice because uh, for a birthday all Dad could afford was an apple and the horse rolled in it and she cried. She told Dad at a couple of meetings and got boxes of apples so she thought she'd better not <laughs> tell it again. But they, <laughs> they never complained and would never lacked anything and they could have said why has God ruined our lives like that but they were there because that's where God had called them and it was difficult and hard losing some twins you couldn't Skype or phone or anything like that no other missionaries around and yet they honoured God I'll tell you what happened 
A few years ago, Loris, my wife, and our daughter, Diane, uh, went to one of these towns where they had worked. And we found this uh, lovely uh, believer who had known my parents. We were only there for one day. Uh, she po- spoke Quechua, the language of the descendants of the Inquis. Our friend from the mission translated into Spanish, and our daughter knows Spanish translated into English. The old lady spoke a lot. The next guy didn't speak so much. When it got down to dying, she said they were sad. So we got an impression that a lot was getting lost in the translation. And then our daughter said, Dad, you need to be recording this, and so we did. And one of the things that this lady said was, we are having trouble with evangelism. And I said, what do you mean? And this was her answer. She said, we're having trouble with evangelism because we have won every single person in this town except for one family to the Lord. It wasn't a place where the chief became a Christian, everyone fell into line, they were persecuted. But she said, not only that, in this place where your parents worked, in this whole region, there are now nine churches, and in this whole region, every single person is a committed follower of Jesus except for one family. That was a few years ago, so I'd say it's pretty much 100% now. That's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, amen. As I said, I never heard my parents ever once say, God, why did you send us to this place? Why did our twins die? Why didn't we see a whole big revival there? But they knew where God wanted them to be and had that confidence that that's where he wanted them to be. Here's another example. This is uh, a young uh, lady called Rosalie McGeorge. She came from Dunedin in the 1880s. And she was a 26-year-old teacher down in Dunedin. When I read the accounts, it said uh, she was an active, committed person and amazingly beautiful. I thought I'd better do some research about that, and I found this this picture. So here was this vibrant, young 26-year-old, felt that God was calling her to be a missionary to East Bengal. We didn't have any missionaries at all, no mission organization. She was meant to have someone else going out with her for whatever reason they pulled out. And so she said, I'm still going. So when she was leaving, her minister at the time, it was Alfred North, and this is what he said. He said, Rosalie, when you go out to East Bengal, uh, this is going to be a great adventure. You know, when you get out there, there's going to be people who are going to welcome your message. And besides that, the climate's a lot better than in Dunedin. That's not what he said at all. This is what he said. He said, The work which lies before you is exceptionally hard and exhausting. The constant excitement and high degree of pity, compassion, and anguish of heart on account of the condition of those amongst whom you will be called to toil will tax and drain your nervous energy. You will be exposed, as all Christian workers have been, to disappointments, the sickness of heart which comes from hope deferred, and you will have to deal with a measure of ignorance regarding spiritual things. And she went. What he was saying was, it's going to be difficult and it's going to be hard. She went out there, did language training, found herself in a a village where she was the first uh, missionary, and a lot of real challenges. She was described as a sensitive nature, refined and carefully nurtured, in the words of another age, a gentlewoman. You know those programs you see on TV and people in big houses and they got little cups of tea and everything and they got nice dresses and everything? That's the kind of background that she came from. If she was on a farm with a swan drying gum boots, that wasn't her at all. But this is where God called her. Well, after, I think it was about four years and... Uh, 1931, she went to the doctor for a routine uh, inspection and found that she had uh, typhoid, I think it was, started her way back to New Zealand 
and at the age of 31, after five years out on the field, she passed away. And I don't think it would, uh, would have happened, but as she was lying on that bed there, she would say, God, why have you ruined my life? She could, should have, uh, could have said this. I don't think for one moment she, she did, but she could have. Why have you ruined my life? I've left everything at home, come out here, and just getting started, and then I'm sick. And maybe the parents and other Christians have said, where is God and what, he, what is he doing? On, from our point of view, it looks a, a complete time of disaster. But do you think that God would mock someone like that with that devotion and commitment and courage? Not at all, and I'll tell you why. In 1970, and I'm not sure what the uh, figures are for today, New Zealand had more missionaries per head of population than any other country in the world. At one stage, it was one for every 2,000. Not every 2,000 people in church, but every 2,000 in the country. Rosalie McGeorge was the first one that went from any of our Baptist churches but those who've done research have said she's probably the first woman from any church in New Zealand that went to share the gospel with someone in another country. A couple of accounts have said she could have been the first person, period, from any church in New Zealand. I think there might have been a couple of others. But the point is this, that the story of the people and Christians and followers of Jesus in this country sharing the gospel with those in another country cannot be told without realizing the role and impact of a 26-year-old from one of our churches. In the recent Olympics, we saw a young woman, Eliza McCartney, set the bar high in the fields of athletics. And here is this young, committed Christian set the bar high in terms of what God can do through us, in terms of courage and commitment. And I think one of the encouraging things for our family of churches is to know what's happened in your congregation here because we know that's exactly what happened from this place and still happening, that folk with commitment and courage have gone to different parts of this country and perhaps overseas. And that is what we're looking for. And I believe that that's part of the heritage of Rosalie McGeorge. And we say, why did God allow something like this to ruin this lovely life? He knew what was happening and working his purposes out. One of the passages of scripture I like is Acts 27. It's a long passage that sort of speaks. Uh, it's a maritime scene when Paul was making his way to Rome. And he knew that this was what God wanted him to do. But then a storm came up. And threaten the whole thing. And when you read the passage of, of Scripture, uh, you can just about put yourself on board that ship. You can sense the blackness of the night. And we look up and see what looks like snow-capped mountains, except they're moving and find that they're waves that are crashing over the ship. We can hear the wind shrieking through the, the rigging and tearing it to bits. We can hear the splintering of the timbers of the mast and the, the decking and the cries of frightened people. And in the midst of it is the Apostle Paul has absolute confidence saying that God has assured me, and in his case, including an angel, that we will get to the destination. It also says in verse 9 and chapter 27 of Acts, that amidst all of this, that they threw four anchors overboard and prayed for the day to come. And I believe that sometimes when we face those difficult times, there are things where we ask where God is, and later on we find out what he was doing, but sometimes there are things that just happen, and we, our hearts are filled with sorrow with the loss that we've had, and it's dark, and there's a storm around. And that's sometimes all that we can do 
is throw those anchors. One of the anchors that we throw over is the anchor of the purpose and destiny of God. And you know what happens when we throw it over? It grabs deep into the love and goodness of God. And then we pray for the day to come. And it will come. But there are those times when we can't explain it. In Paul's case, they got to shore. Sometimes, even godly people, it doesn't happen. I've got three uh, ship stories. That's one of them. When I was a young fellow, my grandfather came from Scotland. He was a gospel soloist. And when he was back in Scotland, he used to sing soloist for uh, an evangelist. His name was John Harper. And um, this man was, his pastor was on the Titanic when it went down. And I remember my grandfather talking about him. This was a man that he used to be a, a soloist for. And John Harper was this evangelist uh, going over to the States to take some meetings. Titanic's going down. Everyone else is trying to cram into the lifeboats. You can Google this, John Harper, Titanic, you'll find the whole story. What he was doing was not frightened at all. Those who recall what happened, recall him going around with groups of people praying for them. And he's going around saying, uh, children and women and unsaved into the lifeboats. And even as the ship was going down, he found himself floating on a, a bit of debris and it only held one person and another fellow came along there and John Harper said, do you know the Lord is your saviour? And he said, no. He said, well, you need this bit of timber more than I do, so let go, let this other fellow have it. And John Harper perished. And when you read the story, you find that here is a man who says, I'm John Harper's last convert. Why did you let, uh, why did God ruin my life? I don't think John Harper had any time to ask that at all. <laughs> and this is what it is to believe in God in the midst of tragedy. He was a man who had absolute confidence in God, knew where he was going and what was happening, and took the opportunity to introduce people to, to Jesus. And so his testimony lives today. And sometimes when we haven't got those clear answers to those difficult times. Then we do throw that anchor overboard and pray for the day to come. There was another man, you've probably heard it. There's a, a well-known old uh, hymn where it says, When peace like a river. This man, Horatio Spafford, was a prominent lawyer in Chicago. He was going to go over to England with his wife and four daughters for a holiday, he had to stay back for business. His wife and daughters went. Their ship collided with an iron sailing ship and sank. And his wife sent a telegram back saying, saved alone, the four girls had died. And later, uh, Horatio Spafford went over to England and he was on the ship and the captain paused as they were going over the spot. He said, this is the spot where your four precious uh, daughters died. And this is the hymn that the, uh, this man wrote. That's only one verse of it. When peace like a river attends my soul, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And I think that when things happen that we think God's ruining our lives, and we can't work it out and we'll never see the full picture until we get to heaven. That is the true miracle. That is well with my soul. I know who my Savior is. I know where I'm going. I have a peace that passes understanding even though all these things are happening about us. And I think the wonderful thing to remember is if life just finished at, finished at the time that we die, it would be terribly unfair. But you know, this isn't our home at all. Amen. We are pilgrims here, and God has the best 
for us waiting. And there's passages like uh, this one in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 where it says, These troubles and sufferings of ours are after all quite small and won't last very long, yet this short time of distress will result in God's blessing upon us forever and ever. Amen. So we do not look at what we can see right now, the troubles all around us, but we look forward to the joys of heaven, which we have not yet seen. The troubles will soon be over, but the joys to come will last forever. When it's talking about these small troubles, these were people who were Christians and were coated in tar and then set a light to light the streets. It wasn't small at all. And our problems may seem big and we may think God has forgotten us, but he said, you're my daughter and my son and whatever you're going through, it's nothing at all compared to what I've got compared to prepared for you when we're down in Christchurch I focused on helping the police because our folk at Darfield were doing all right we had a retired minister come there and he had a verse that I shared with some of these tough guys that had come from around the world uh, to work in the mortuary and things like this from Romans 15 verse 4 it says for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. That is a great uh, scripture, uh, and it reminds us that in these difficult times when he can't understand what's happening, go into your Bible, find the way that God helped people in the past and dealt with them. You know, you've been looking at the series uh, Champions, and the champions were the ones who trusted God in those difficult times. So it says, through the scriptures and through endurance. And endurance means keeping on and trusting and serving God, even though we at times cannot understand what's happening. And finally, we do it because we walk in the feet of the Master and those early disciples. And we can see them standing at the foot of the cross and the sky growing darker until it was black. And they heard the voice in the night which said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And here were these followers of Jesus standing there and probably thinking to the God of the Father, Why is this happening? completely discouraged. And we meet two of them a day or two after that, going out through a small gate on the wall of Jerusalem, down a winding road to a town called Emmaus. And when we see them, we see their shoulders hunched in despondency and sadness. They hardly speak, and when they do, their voices quiver as they remembered who Jesus was and what he had done. And now it just seemed like a dream that had gone bad and the beginning of a very black night. While we know the, the story, that as they walked, there was a stranger came alongside them and spoke with them and then met with them in an upper room and broke bread. And it says, as he did so, their hearts were strangely warmed. That meant that they were filled with God's Spirit and they knew that the Saviour that they served was alive, that he was powerful, and they would go any place and do anything to serve him, and they did. And here's the God that we serve. There's a, a wonderful song, I've played it uh, through a number of times. It's a gospel song, and if you Google Gaither Tent Revival, uh, Guy Penrod and the song Then Came the Morning and it's got this verse They all walked away with nothing to say They had just lost their dearest friend All that he said <clears throat> now that he was dead So this was the way it would end The dreams they had dreamed were not what they seemed Now that he was dead and gone The garden, the jail, the hammer, the nail how could a night be so long? 
And then it has this wonderful chorus, Then came the morning. Night turned into day, the stone was rolled away, hope rose with the dawn, then came the morning, shadows vanished before the sun, death had lost and life had won, for morning had come. And you know, that's what we do in those difficult times, times of sorrow and difficulty. We put out the anchor, pray for the day to come, and the dawn will come. And if we don't see it completely here, what God has prepared for those who trust him and believe him, even in the difficult times, is absolutely nothing compared to what we've got right now. Amen.